Living Waters presents On the Box. Well, welcome to the Monday. <laughs> Mark! Mark! What happened? I have no, I can't say. Welcome to the Monday edition of On the Box. Ron is with us today. I'd be yelling and screaming about that, but right now I feel like I'm in the principal's office. Yeah. That's true. How, how are you, Ron? I'm doing Sir? well. Glad to be here today. Good. We affectionately refer to Ron as the grown-up in the building because he is and the rest of us are not. That's right. So, what you do this weekend? Um, let's see. Uh, my daughter was in a musical this weekend. And so Which I got one? to Little Women. Yeah. She was Amy. She did Fantabulous. And if she sees this, I will tell the was world. Was that a school play or a community play? Yeah, or? it was her high school play. So uh, she's a senior this year. So it's so a musical. So it's her last stint as a thespian it, in it the high was, school. It was her first and last. Really? Yeah. And this and is new for her. You wouldn't know it. I mean, wow, she was that good, huh? She was. So, yeah, we've been doing that for the last two weekends. So, yeah. that was a lot of fun. A lot of oh, tears really? to see her do that. Well, so, yeah, very proud dad here. Good. So, and then um, I, um, I was asked to, to perform the ceremony. You know, before the show, we were talking to each other, oh, and, you should he be asked, us. And, and he asked me, what did you do this weekend? And I said, well, I get to marry my brother-in-law and her fiancé. And really Tony looks at me, deadpan face, and says... Is that I legal in California? Is that legal in California? And I looked at him, and I said, well, yes. But you're already married. Yeah. See, it was much funnier was before so the show. It was so much funnier before the show. Yeah. I can't believe you took that turn on me like that. I know. Well, it's just the way my brain works. There was a mistake before, and I had to fix it. So, and anyway. <coughs> yeah, so. Um, we I try not to fix things on the show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I should know by now because I watch every day. Yeah. But, um, no, I get to perform the ceremony for uh, my brother in law and uh, his fiance, and. Um, it was just a really neat time. My wife and I went out to dinner with them, and, and we were talking about the ceremony, and then uh, really just got to, to share the word with them about what a Christian marriage really is. Just, and, I, you know, they're, I don't know, they're not, you know, committed as far as I know, but they, they definitely feel the pull um, of the Lord, you know, when you speak to them about um, they're open Christian to the things, things of open, God. Yeah, and it's, I mean, there's a, especially in her, you can see that there's a pull and a desire for that to be an integral part of her life. And they had just gone to a, a wedding of their friend, and they had actually seen, you know, that that particular pastor do the same thing that, that I'm going to be doing as far as sharing, you know, that the marriage is a representation, a picture of what Christ's relationship is with his bride, the church, and how it all comes together. And yeah. How actually the marriage ceremony, while it's a celebration for them, it's, it's also their opportunity to share their faith, you know, with the people that are there. It is a witnessing opportunity for them. So yeah. anyway, they were very excited about that. They when's were, that uh, happening? Uh, in April. April. So yeah, coming up. Good. Yeah, that was good. Anything else? Uh, no, I slept. I was very Excellent. tired. Excellent. Yes. Novel idea on the weekend. It, n yeah, it was. So, Mark, did you go out Friday night? I, <laughs> I did. What is he laughing um, at? I don't mean to be laughing. Um, yes, I, I took a team out on uh, Friday night. Uh, some of us went over to uh, the Glass House in Pomona and did some open-air preaching outside where uh, these heavy metal bands uh, were playing. And then the others of us who had young kids, I took my whole family, I got five kids, as you know, we went over to uh, the Orange Block. Now, I told my kids and everybody else inside the class, there was about 20, 25 people inside there, that, hey, you need to be really uh, incognito when you hand out gospel tracts. You need to be very careful because the security will come up to you and will bring you out to your vehicle, watch you drop off your tracks, and then allow you to come back into the venue. So as I say that, we end up getting over to the Orange Block, and my kids end up handing out 
close to 300 gospel tracks going crazy, <laughs> and they didn't get caught. In fact, one of my sons went to give a gospel track to a security guard. I love that. And uh, my youngest son comes up, and he hits the arm of my uh, <laughs> my other son. So, oh, no, not him. Not him. Let's go. So they disappeared on into the crowd, and they kept on uh, going. But... That's great. Boy, it's uh, nothing like having your kids with you to make you feel lukewarm yeah. with the way they uh, reach out. But it was a great time. Oh, good. Excellent. Well, I, w I went out to uh, Third Street Promenade on Saturday, mm -hmm. as usual. Went out a little later. Usually we're out there from about 11 to 2. We went out from 1 to 4 to see if the crowds would be any better. And? Uh, and they were. Oh. And yeah. they were. Uh, we were able to draw some uh, crowds and uh, had some poor hecklers, but hecklers who helped to draw more crowds. And then... Uh, had a really neat conversation with a guy named Mike. Sorry. <laughs> this is a live show, isn't it? it <laughs> we try to keep it that way. Yeah, I'm really, yeah I'm, it's I'm pretty easy to, to critique from I'm the big office upstairs, <laughs> ain't it? <laughs> I'm, trying yeah. to, I'm trying to concentrate on what you're saying and every single word. And you said the phrase, poor hecklers. And, of course, my mind just kind of went, well, go bash the poor. I'm Ray <laughs> is not sitting here today. Ron <laughs> Love is sitting here today. I'm sorry. Go ahead. This guy? This guy, named Mike, Yes. asked if he could talk to me after I was done preaching. Mm. And he had been there for a while. And uh, we had a great conversation for about a half hour or so. Not a believer, but uh, open to the things of God. And had been trying church after church after church and found them all to be hypocritical. And it got to the point in the conversation where I said, you know, it might not be the church. Mm. It might be the fact that, you know, the law is bringing you to conviction. Right. So, anyways, uh, he asked me where I went to church. Uh, he lives a good distance away from where I live and where I go to church. And uh, he said, okay, I'm going to try to come tomorrow. And and he did. That's because a church alive is worth the drive. <laughs> it's going to get better, aren't it? it yeah, no, no, it's, it's not. Go no? ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah. And so he did come. And uh, one of the elders and uh, uh, another man in the church continued to share the gospel with him. He's going to come back next week. So, you know, those things don't happen all the nice. time when you're yes. out there doing evangelism biblically. Mm. Um, and so it was neat, neat to see. Very good. Neat to see. Good news. Ready to go? <coughs> I'm ready. All right. Let's do this. <laughs> Daniel's board. Daniel's wrap it up. Daniel's board. Come on. Speed up. All right. First <laughs> question. And we actually received uh, two or three different, from different people, two or three similar questions. Uh, my passion for evangelism continues to grow and grow. I can't stop being absolutely on fire for sharing the gospel. I was wondering, is there any way to make a living as an evangelist? Uh, I love the kids at my school and my job. Uh, apparently this person's a teacher. Uh, but I can't help but feel like evangelism apologetics is my life's calling. If there is anyone you can put me in touch with, uh, people who know how to make evangelism a career, obviously, obviously for me it's calling first, but if I could spend my life doing this during the nine to five hours, that would be great, Mark. You know, I've traveled with uh, Ray for about 15, 16 years now. And I have people, young guys, budding evangelists that will approach Ray from time to time over the course of those years and say, man, I would love to do what you're doing. I mean, where do you see yourself five years from now or even 10 years from now, Mr. Comfort? And he would say, I see myself doing what I'm doing now, but to a greater degree. To which they said, wow, okay. So, so what do you mean by that? He said, well, I, I see myself evangelizing and uh, writing books and uh, writing articles and doing everything that an evangelist should be doing, but to a greater capacity with more people being influenced by what I'm doing. He goes, well, how do I do what you're doing? To which Ray would respond without any hesitation. He says, be faithful with the small things because there is no such thing as a small thing in the eyes of God. So if you're faithful doing what God has called you to do, to share, to write, to preach, to evangelize, to go door to door, to encourage, if you're doing those things, God will open up more doors and bigger doors for you to walk through. You need to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So that's really from Ray Comfort, and I, I've grabbed a hold of it, and I've shared it many times with many people since that time, and I've adopted it as my very own. So I think if you want to do this 9 to 5, that's really a great idea, but ultimately God has to open up that door. You don't want to be inside of a ministry that God doesn't want you to be, and God will lead you as you are faithful with the smaller things that God is calling you to do. Ron? 
Yeah, I, I agree, Mark. It's um, something that that uh, God has had to teach me in in my ministry. You know, uh, at whether in, in our church um, is strive for nothing. You know, it's if God has something that He wants you to do, then He is going to do that work in you and through you. Um, the minute I try to get involved and try to find how to do it, try to find the position, try to you know, work it all out. Um, just the evidence in my own life shows that, that that just fails, you know. But whereas if I just do the things that God tells me to do, such as in this case, go out and evangelize, go out, share your faith, that the mechanics of how it happens, I leave that up to the Lord to do. If he's going to give me a position um, where uh, at that place of, of business or, or ministry, that becomes my, my full-time job, then great, but it's him doing it, which means that he knows the perfect timing for it. He knows when I'm ready for it, um, but I shouldn't necessarily try to push those things. Yeah. You know, if God is going to move me into an area of, of ministering full-time as an evangelist, then you got to let him do that, you know, otherwise there's, there's a lot of potential for, for problems. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people, we run into this quite a bit, a lot of people are under the impression that if you serve at Living Waters, you are out on the streets doing evangelism, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Yeah. And that couldn't be further from the truth. We right. spend so much time here in the building, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, mm -hmm. uh, putting things together to be able to train others to do evangelism, to equip and encourage other Christians to fulfill the Great Commission. Right. Uh, most of the evangelism we do uh, on a personal level is after hours. It's after we get home from the office. It's on the weekends or you know, Friday night, Saturday, when we take our own teams out or, or go out and do evangelism. Uh, it's actually rare that we actually have the time to go out Monday through Friday during the day mm -hmm. when the building's open to go out and do uh, evangelism. And then a question I would have for uh, uh, this person who's so passionate about evangelism, what if, uh, what if the Lord never opened a door for you to receive an income from evangelism? Would that change your passion at all? And if it does, then you might want to reconsider your motivations for going into uh, evangelism. You know, it, uh, uh, I thought I was going to be a pastor in a pulpit for yeah. the rest of my life. Actually, I thought I was going to be a homicide detective for the rest, the rest of my life. No, that didn't work. So, um, you know, I thought the Lord was calling me to be a full-time pastor. Right. And that wasn't where he was taking me. Then it was full-time missions for six or seven years. That wasn't it. Uh, and it was, you know, a little over four years ago that I got the call from this ministry, not pursuing coming down here to this ministry, that the Lord opened the door for me to serve at, at Living Waters. Right. Yeah, and there's always the example, you know, that, that you see in Scripture of, of Paul where, you know, while he was doing his ministry in order to provide right. the income that he needed, he made tents, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of times that goes hand in hand, you know. And, and sometimes it could even be a, a really good thing because then you're not mixing the, uh, the financial aspect of your life with your ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and it can keep things clean. That's not to say that, you know, it has to be that way, but right. I definitely can see the benefit from that. Yeah. Okay. We got, uh, I saw this picture on uh, Facebook today from Ina in Norway. You with me, Danny? Um, <laughs> I'd like you to be. Uh, <laughs> Ina posted this picture on uh, Facebook. <laughs> She's, she wrote, hi, everyone. I uh, got this sign up. A bunch of people ski uh, where she has a sign here. Did it early this morning. Pray that people's lives will be changed. Now, they do a lot of skiing in Norway. And so, a lot of snow. so Ina made this sign for uh, 180 and uh, posted it on the uh, slopes of some ski area in Norway. And so I could just picture, can we come back to us now, Danny? I could just picture people slaloming down uh, the slopes together, to, together and oh. seeing the 180 sign and <laughs> hitting a tree. That's right. I like doing slalom. Slalom? Is that where she... No. Slalom? Yeah, uh, yeah. So way to go, Ina. I know Ina watches the show. It's neat that we have uh, faithful evangelists uh, watching the show from all over the world. Right. And uh, Ina is one of them in Norway. So where will you put up a 180 sign hmm. this week? You know, if I've, not on a ski slope in Norway. I'm really surprised um, about uh, one billboard in particular that we have up. And that's the one in Huntington Beach mm -hmm. here uh, in California. Because... Uh, so many people have actually come up to me to let me know that they saw the billboard and they were just so happy and so amazed. And this one girl from 
uh, my daughter's uh, class at school, she you know, Facebook my daughter and with a picture of the billboard and she's got her thumb up, you know, like that. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it's just, it's just really cool when you see the fruit of that, you know, when we have it at other places, you know, we don't live there, so we don't know, you know, what's going on. So having something here really close to home has been, um, I know, kind of exciting yeah. for me. And I can see the excitement in people who have seen the video um, and then they see it, you know, the billboard out there and they're just really excited that, oh, hey, I know that. You know. Yesterday on uh, Third Street Promenade, one of the guys on the team was wearing a 180 t-shirt, and multiple times people came up to him and said, "Wow, I've seen that! I've seen that video. Thank you so much for it." In fact, I had an opportunity to have a conversation uh, with a member of a very significant church in the Calvary Chapel movement, mm -hmm. who says, "I'm getting this to my pastor, and I just saw it this morning. I love it. We need to show this at our church." And so it's, it's that kind of word of mouth momentum that we want to keep going uh, with the ministry. So wear those t-shirts, get the business cards out, hand out the DVDs, do whatever you can to keep the momentum going for uh, 180. All right, question number three. You ready, Mark? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, this is a pretty deep yeah. question. This is a pretty deep issue here. Yes, it is. And, uh, and uh, I think Mark is going to have an answer. I know Mark's going to have Mark's it because right. we prayed for that. That's right. So <laughs> don't rebel. Don't rebel. The pressure's on. All right. Uh, the person writes, I'm currently in an EMT in training, and I've come across a serious life or death issue. When it comes to human life, I would never give up the fight. When it comes to resuscitation, no matter how old, hopeless, or futile the situation may be. However, I've been informed of what is commonly referred to as a do not resuscitate uh, or uh, DNR. Uh, this form is signed by the patient's doctor in the event, actually the patient, in the event that they are in final stages of cancer, HIV AIDS, or some other ailment that will ultimately be terminal. Uh, this form is said to have been requested and approved by the patient themselves. Uh, I do not believe in not resuscitating them simply because that's like pulling the plug, literally as well as figuratively. What, what is one to do in a situation like this? If I don't perform CPR and other life-saving techniques, I feel like their blood will be on my hands. On the other hand, if I do, uh, I may lose my job, become involved in major tort lawsuits, and could lose my freedom as a result. Is this the price I, I'd have to pay for being persecuted for my beliefs? I would, glad, I would be glad, or I would gladly, if it meant it was ordained by Jesus Christ, <coughs> the Savior. No, let's not pick on him first. No, let's not do that. Let's not do that. Okay. Um, we run. I run into this in law enforcement as well. Not the exact same thing, but you know, I, I've talked to a number of officers who have said, you know, now that I'm a follower of Christ, I don't know if I could take another human life. Now I show them that in the context of uh, serving in law enforcement or military, that it is biblical to do so. Mm -hmm. But there are those out there whose conscience is such that they do not believe it would be right for them to take another human life. And I've run into a couple of officers like that. Typically, it's people who come to faith in Christ after they got on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, most people reconcile these issues uh, before uh, coming on the job if they're, if they're Christians. But if you come to faith in Christ, you know, your worldview is changing, you're thinking about these things. And my counsel to those who don't think they could take uh, a human life is that they should leave. They should leave the job. It uh, doesn't make you uh, a worse person, doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that you're not right for this line of work. Uh, you're a danger to yourself and others if you're not willing to make that ultimate decision if the need arises. And I would say the same is true here uh, with this uh, EMT in training. Um, it is lawful, and uh, it, for some it is a moral decision right. uh, to establish that DNR, that do not resuscitate order uh, in their wills, in uh, their living trusts. You know, if, if they are uh, in a situation medically, physically, where there is no hope for life, they're going to be on, they're going to need uh, resuscitators, they're going to need to be kept alive by machines. Uh, some have made the decision, I don't want that, I don't want that for me, I don't want that for my family. And so if, I, if my heart stops beating, if I stop breathing, don't resuscitate me at that point. Now, the policies uh, of the 
the EMT crew you're with, the hospital, the department you're with, uh, they were established before you came on the department. And the department policy is if there is a do not resuscitate order, mm -hmm. you do not resuscitate. Uh, if you do that, you're facing legal action. Right. So my, res my answer for the person who has these deeply held beliefs is that being an EMT may not be for you. Uh, that, that may not be the line of work uh, you should be in. And if you go forward with this, if you decide to go through the training and uh, you refuse to abide by a DNR while you're on the job and you're disciplined or fired, that is not persecution for your faith. That is a violation of policy. It wouldn't matter whether you're a Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist, an atheist. You know, if you violate the policy of, of your department that says we will honor and abide by DNRs and you refuse, mm -hmm. you're not being persecuted because you're a Christian. You're being fired because you violated uh, department policy. So I, don't violate your conscience. To him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin, James 4:17. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, barring that, if, if you can't abide by the policy of your department, you ought to find work elsewhere. This might not be the job for you. Exactly. So, Mark, <laughs> should we just continue? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way of getting out of answering the question. All right. Wow, we're down to five minutes? Are you serious? Wow, okay. We're going to... We're going to uh, end today's show with a presentation of the gospel. Um, I didn't know this person before I went to the Super Bowl outreach last weekend. His name is Dustin Seegers. If you uh, know our friend Cy Ten Bruggenkeit, uh, he has done some debates with him. Uh, not against him, but with him as they together uh, debate atheists and others. And uh, I heard him open air preach for the first time this weekend. And in my mind, he's a great open air preacher. Here's about five minutes of one of his open airs at the Super Bowl outreach. Hi, my name is Dustin Seegers. I am a pastor of Shepherd's Fellowship in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I'm out here today. I'm not mad at you or anything like that, but I want to give you some good news. The good news is this, that while you and I were sinners, violated God's law, God demonstrated his love toward people hey, like you and I, you, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, we can't really appreciate the good news unless we understand the bad news. It's like if I came up to you and I said, hey, I want to give you this shot. You're like, dude, you're not going to stick a shot in my rear end. But if I came to you and you were in a doctor's office and I was a physician and I brought in MRIs and I showed you that you had a mass growing inside of you and that you're going to be dead in six months, but if I gave you this shot, it's going to give you what you need in order to cure your disease, then you would understand why you need the shot. Well, that's the way it is with the gospel. See, the Bible tells us that each one of us have sinned. We violated God's standards of perfection. And each one of us has sinned and fallen short of God's perfect standards. And the problem is that, that everybody wants a good God, but they want a good God on their terms, not on God's terms. And God says this, God will not allow the unrighteous to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what it says. So when people die and they stand before God on the day of judgment, what's going to happen is all of their sins are going to be weighed against them in God's courtroom of justice, as it were. And as a result of that, people will be held accountable for all the sins that they committed against God. And because God is fair, God is just, and God is righteous, God is more good than anybody could ever imagine, God is going to be fair with those who have violated His law. And if we're found to be criminals in God's courtroom, God is going to uh, give us a penalty, and that penalty is death, eternal death, in hell. And that's because God is good. But now listen, God has provided a solution to that problem. And the Bible says that God sent Jesus Christ into the world to die on the cross, a cross much like this. He died on the cross to save people from that impending judgment. And the bad news is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the good news is that God demonstrated His love toward people like you and I, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Scripture tells us Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. And I'm here today in love. I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to stand before a righteous and a holy God and get what you deserve. I want you to be forgiven by God and receive His mercy and His grace and His compassion. And that can only happen when you turn from your sins and put your faith in Christ. The Bible tells us 700 years before Jesus was born that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It, it describes us like we're sheep. And sheep are pretty dumb animals. Sheep pretty much do what they want to do. They don't want to listen to, you know, pretty much what their master says. That's why the master has to come along and protect the sheep from themselves. Well, the Bible describes us that way as sheep. The Bible says all of us like sheep have gone astray. 
and each of us has gone to our own way, but God laid on Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. But here's the condition. In order to be forgiven by God, you must repent. You've got to turn from your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ. Apart from that, God is going to give you what you deserve, which is righteous judgment. And I don't want that for you. That's why I'm here today heralding the good news. The bad news is that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But the good news is that God has demonstrated His love and His mercy and His grace in Christ Jesus. And all of those who, you know, have lied, stolen, cheated, all of those that have committed sins against God, those people can be forgiven based upon what Jesus did for them on the cross. But in order for them to cash in on that spiritual benefit, they've got to turn from trusting in themselves to make themselves right with God, and they've got to trust in what Jesus did on the cross for their sins. See, Jesus died on the cross for their sins. The scripture says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Bible tells us that Jesus took our law place. You know where the, we deserve to be punished you know for our sins. Yes, do you have a question? You know where the Pan Am Plaza is? No, sir, I don't. Okay. Do you have a question about God, philosophy, or Jesus? No, just where the Pan Am Plaza is. Where the Pan Am Plaza is. Hey, guys, let me, let me ask you a question for a minute. Are you guys ready to meet God? Because that's the most important. Are you ready? I'm good with I got my own. Okay, so we have a gentleman here that says he's good with God. I wish he kind of would have hung around so we could have a good discussion. That's really what I want to do. I want to enter into a good conversation with you folks. So if anybody wants to, if you're a skeptic, an atheist, you're an unbeliever of any stripe, that'd be great. I'd love to talk to you. I used to be an atheist myself. Ready for some football? Let me ask you this, my friend. Are you ready to meet Jesus Christ on the day of judgment? See, that's a whole lot more important than football. I hope you are too, my friend. That's why I'm here today. I'm appealing to people to be reconciled to God. See, I, because I love you and I care about you, I'm willing to stand on this box and leave my family, which is about 1,500 miles away, and come here so that I can preach the good news to you folks. There are many people here today that are on the broad path that leads to destruction. And Jesus put it this way. He said, enter into the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many people who are on that path, but the way to eternal life is very, very narrow, and there are few who find it. And my friends, I'm here today out of love, calling to you to turn from your sins. Turn to Christ. Trust in Him. Don't look this Now, Mark, have you met Dustin before? Uh, you know, I'm not sure if I have uh, met Dustin You're before. familiar with him. Yeah, I'm definitely familiar with him. Uh, from watching Cy and uh, Dustin uh, debate people, but I'll tell you that it seems to be a textbook open-air preaching session yeah. that seems to be around for a while, and it ain't going to go anywhere. So if you want to learn the presuppositional approach while open-air preaching or doing one-on-one, -on -one, you want to grab a hold of his channel. He has his own YouTube channel, so you want to go and you want to learn the ideas and the philosophies behind it and how to, in love, speak the truth because that's what he does and he hits it out of the park but I'm excited if not in this life and the next one to come to be able to hang out with him yeah uh, in fact uh, that five minute segment of that open air was actually uh, a 40 minute open air uh, and he is excellent so hey we are out of time want to thank you for joining us thanks for coming downstairs out of the yeah no problem out of the big office to join us today why do you keep saying the big office well it's bigger than mine <laughs> yeah but it Okay. It's bigger than Daniels? What bigger than Mark's? Let's move on. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> bigger than Brad's? Hey, I have a lot of storage. It's bigger than Eddie's and Dale's? A lot of storage, a lot of paper. You got a lot of space in there. Enough Whatever. room for a couch, a couple hey, chairs. The show's over. Lots of pictures. Yes, God bless you all. Till tomorrow, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. <laughs> Proclaim the gospel. Living Waters presents On the Box.